I gave my children an ultimatum. If they worked for five years, they would get all the wealth, but I suddenly learned about my parents' fraud. I'm a 62-year-old father and have been running my own advertising company for nearly 37 years now. My wife, who's 59, and I have been married for 36 years, and we have two grown-up children, Mason, who's 34, and Olivia, who's 32. When my parents passed, they left me a significant amount of wealth, which played a big role in helping me grow my company to where it stands today. Needless to say, we've become pretty well off over the years, something I'm incredibly thankful for. But this inheritance wasn't just some small amount of money. It was the kind of wealth that could change someone's life entirely. It's the kind of money that could easily vanish if it ended up in the wrong hands. My wife and I have always valued the importance of hard work. We didn't come from money. We both hustled to build what we have today. We tried to give Mason and Olivia opportunities we didn't have, but now I'm worried that maybe we went overboard. My parents weren't what you'd call wealthy by any stretch of the imagination, but they were comfortable. When they passed, they left me a substantial amount of real estate, bought when land prices were a fraction of what they are now. However, I didn't touch any of that money until I'd earned enough on my own. I wanted to prove to myself, and maybe even to them, wherever they might be, that I could succeed without relying on their money. So I put all my energy into growing my advertising business from the ground up, and today it's doing exceptionally well. Over the years, my wife and I made sure that Mason and Olivia never lacked anything growing up. They had access to the finest education, the best clothes, and every opportunity we could offer them. But that's where things have become complicated. I worked hard for what I have and wanted to give my kids a better life than I had. But as soon as I started making a lot of money, I think I may have lost perspective. Mason and Olivia didn't have to take up summer jobs or worry about paying for their college tuition. They didn't have to face the kind of struggles I dealt with growing up. And now, as adults, they're both living off the money we've set aside for them, without any desire to work or build something of their own. It's disheartening. Mason spends his days spending money on high-end gadgets and partying with friends, while Olivia is caught up in this influencer lifestyle, building her brand, with no real focus or goal in sight. We had set up trust funds for Mason and Olivia when they were born, and by the time they turned 27, they had more money than I ever had at their age. They grew up in an entirely different world than I did, never having to experience the hard realities of life. As adults, they're completely disconnected from reality, living comfortably off their trust funds and not lifting a finger to earn anything for themselves. I had always hoped that as they matured, they would gain some ambition, but here we are. Mason and Olivia are content with this unearned lifestyle, and it's driving me crazy. Mason doesn't see the need to work, while Olivia believes her brand is her career, even though there's no substance to it. They're entitled, lazy, and have no appreciation for what they've been given because they've never had to work for any of it. My wife, bless her, is far more patient with them than I am. She tells me they'll come around when they're ready, but I'm skeptical. Things finally came to a head a few weeks ago at a family dinner. My wife and I were casually discussing what our retirement might look like, not making any concrete plans, just talking about our future. As expected, Mason and Olivia weren't paying attention until the topic of inheritance came up. Suddenly, they were both fully engaged in the conversation. I mentioned the idea of them possibly taking over the company someday, but they immediately dismissed it. Mason actually laughed and said he didn't want to waste his life working in an office. Olivia sarcastically remarked that she was far too busy with her career to even think about such things. That's when I started to lose it. I asked them what they intended to do with their lives, and they both shrugged like it didn't matter. Mason said he didn't need to work thanks to his trust fund and Olivia claimed she was building her brand, whatever that means. I realized at that moment that the biggest mistake I'd made was giving them too much, too soon. When I was their age, I was up before the sun working on construction projects, doing everything I could to make ends meet. My children, on the other hand, seem happy to coast through life, living off the family fortune. I tried to explain to them that life isn't just about taking the easy way out, that working hard for something is what gives it meaning but they wouldn't listen. They flat out told me they had no intention of ever working real jobs or contributing to society in any meaningful way. It was like trying to talk to a wall. After that dinner, I couldn't shake the frustration. 
My children are grown adults, but they're acting like spoiled teenagers who have never had to earn a single thing in their lives. I started wondering where I went wrong. I spent years building a business that could set them up for life, and instead of being grateful, they're taking it all for granted. Something needed to change, fast. The next morning, I sat down with my wife and laid out my plan. We needed to intervene before Mason and Olivia became completely useless adults with no sense of purpose. My wife wasn't thrilled with the idea at first. She's always had more patience than me, but eventually, she agreed that we needed to take action. At the next family dinner, I dropped the bombshell. I told Mason and Olivia that I was changing the terms of their inheritance. From that point on, they wouldn't receive a penny unless they held down legitimate full-time jobs for at least five years. And by jobs, I meant positions completely unrelated to our family business. They needed to work for someone else, earn a paycheck, and prove they could stand on their own two feet. No calling in favors, no cushy jobs handed to them through our connections. They had to do it on their own. Their reactions were priceless. Mason scoffed like I'd told him the most absurd thing he'd ever heard, while Olivia just sat there in shock, like I'd betrayed her in some way. I explained to them that this was non-negotiable. They either step up and make something of themselves, or they lose out on their inheritance. Mason was the first to snap. He slammed his hand on the table and accused me of being unfair, saying that I was holding their futures hostage. Olivia chimed in, saying I didn't understand how the world works today and that I was trying to ruin their lives by forcing them into situations they didn't want. My wife, ever the peacemaker, tried to find some sort of compromise, but I stood firm. This wasn't about being cruel. It was about giving them a much-needed reality check. After that dinner, Mason and Olivia stormed out of the house, furious. They didn't speak to us for weeks, which was unusual, given how much they typically depended on us for everything. My wife was torn between supporting me and trying to smooth things over with the kids, but in the end, she stood by me. She agreed that they needed this wake-up call, harsh as it might be. A few weeks later, Mason finally called, but it wasn't to apologize. He wanted to argue. He told me I was being unreasonable, that forcing him to get a real job was setting him up for failure. He went on about how different things were for his generation and how I didn't understand the challenges he was facing. I listened but I didn't give in. I told him that everyone has to start somewhere, and if he was serious about his future, he'd find a way to make it work. Olivia, on the other hand, tried a different approach. She didn't come to me directly. She went through my wife, trying to convince her that I was being too hard on her career. She insisted that she was on the verge of making it big and that I was sabotaging her success. My wife, bless her, tried to be diplomatic but ultimately told Olivia that she needed to stop relying on us and start taking control of her life. Neither of them took it well. Mason accused us of being completely out of touch, while Olivia threatened to cut us out of her life entirely. It felt like a slap in the face, but we didn't back down. We made it clear that this was the new reality, and if they wanted to inherit anything from us, they needed to prove they could stand on their own two feet. We've been in a standoff ever since. My wife is doing her best to keep the peace, but Mason and Olivia aren't budging. They're still convinced we're being unreasonable, and they're not shy about telling us so. Part of me feels guilty, like I'm pushing them too hard, but another part of me knows this is the right thing to do. They need to learn how to be independent, even if it means they're angry with us for a while. It's been a little over three weeks since I posted about the situation with my kids, and let's just say things have gotten even messier. Mason and Olivia decided to drag the rest of the family into this. They went straight to my in-laws and some cousins, complaining about how unfairly they were being treated. Before long, I was getting phone calls and messages from family members who hadn't spoken to me in months, suddenly very interested in giving their two cents. My father-in-law, who has always been soft on the kids, called first. He thought I was being too hard on them and suggested that maybe I should go easier, while my mother-in-law actually backed me up. She had been watching Mason and Olivia grow more spoiled by the day and was just as worried as I was that they'd never learn how to manage on their own. Then my cousin started getting involved. One cousin, who I've always been close with, told me he understood why I was doing this but warned me not to push too hard. He reminded me that kids today face a different world, with new challenges we didn't deal with growing up. Another cousin, a successful lawyer, wasn't as sympathetic. 
She outright accused me of trying to control their lives and said I should let them make their own mistakes, even if it means they fail. Despite all this outside pressure, I stood firm. I explained to everyone that this wasn't about control. It was about ensuring Mason and Olivia had the skills and mindset they'd need to succeed in life. I wasn't expecting them to become millionaires overnight, just to hold down real jobs and contribute to society. This wasn't going to be easy for them, but I believed it was necessary. As expected, Mason and Olivia didn't take this sitting down. Mason decided he was going to become an entrepreneur. He jumped into day trading after reading about people making a fortune online. He took what little money he had left and poured it into investments, but in a matter of weeks, he lost nearly everything. When he called me asking for more money to invest, I flat out refused. That conversation ended with him hanging up on me, and we haven't spoken much since. Olivia took a different approach. She started attending these networking events, which, from what I can tell, are just fancy parties where people talk about themselves over cocktails. She claimed she was making valuable connections that would help grow her career, but I knew better. It was just another way for her to avoid doing any real work. When I asked her how these connections were translating into opportunities, she got defensive and accused me of not believing in her. At this point, it's clear that both Mason and Olivia are trying to find ways around my ultimatum. They want the inheritance without the effort, and it's incredibly frustrating. Still, I'm not backing down. They need to experience the reality of earning their own way, even if it means they struggle for a while. It's been eight months since I first told Mason and Olivia about the inheritance change, and things have taken a turn I didn't quite expect. After several months of radio silence, Mason finally realized that he couldn't continue living off what little he had left. With no steady income and no help from us, he was forced to look for work. He initially aimed high, applying for jobs he had no experience in, but when those didn't pan out, he had to lower his expectations. Eventually, Mason found a position at a local shipping company. It wasn't anything glamorous, basic warehouse work with early morning hours, but it was a real job. The first few weeks were rough, and he made sure we knew it. He complained about the long hours, the physical demands, and how much he hated the monotony. But my wife and I kept encouraging him to stick it out. Slowly, and I do mean slowly, he started to adapt. Mason's been working at the warehouse for almost five months now, and while he still doesn't love it, I've noticed a change in him. He's starting to take pride in the fact that he's earning his own paycheck, and even though it's not much, he's managed to save a little of it. It's a small step, but it's progress. Olivia's journey has been different. After her networking events dried up, she realized she needed to get serious. One of her contacts suggested a job at a small public relations firm, doing some basic administrative work. It wasn't the glamorous career she'd envisioned, but she needed the money, so she took the job. The adjustment wasn't easy. Olivia was used to being her own boss, so having deadlines and responsibilities didn't sit well with her at first. But like with Mason, we kept encouraging her, and over time, she started to find her footing. She's been at the PR firm for about four months now, and while it's still not what she wants to do forever, she's beginning to see the value in building something from the ground up. As for family dynamics, things are slowly improving. Our once tense family dinners are starting to feel more relaxed. Mason and Olivia are still adjusting to their new realities, but there's also a sense of relief. They're finally taking responsibility for themselves, and while they're not thrilled about it, they're making it work. My wife and I have done our best to support them emotionally without enabling their old habits. To my surprise, Mason and Olivia have started to bond over their shared experiences. They've always been close, but now they're sharing advice about their jobs, talking about their struggles, and learning from each other. It's nice to see them finally supporting one another. Some of our extended family, who initially criticized our decision, are now coming around. They've noticed the changes in Mason and Olivia and have commented on how much more mature they seem. It's a relief to see the family tension easing a bit. It's been a year since this all started, and I can honestly say things are looking up. Recently, we had a big family meeting with Mason and Olivia to discuss how things were going and what the next steps would be regarding their inheritance. I opened the conversation by telling them how proud I was of the progress they'd made. Mason, who is stuck with his job at the shipping company, has developed a strong work ethic. He's even been promoted once, 
and though he still grumbles about the work, he's clearly becoming more independent. He started saving money and has mentioned possibly taking some online courses to improve his skills. It's a huge change from where he was a year ago. Olivia's progress has been equally impressive. She's still working at the PR firm, but she's taken on more responsibility and even led a few small projects. She's also enrolled in some business courses and is beginning to see how her creativity can be channeled into a career. She's not chasing social media fame anymore. She's focused on building something real. As we revisited the inheritance conditions, both Mason and Olivia accepted them without argument. They understood that the two years of steady work I'd required was non-negotiable, but it's clear they're no longer fighting the idea. They're making the most of the opportunities they have, and for the first time, I'm optimistic about their futures. It's been two full years since we set the conditions for the inheritance, and I'm thrilled to report that Mason and Olivia have truly grown. Both of them met the conditions, five years of full-time work, and have shown that they can be independent and responsible. At our final family meeting, I acknowledged how much they've changed. Mason, who's now been promoted twice at the shipping company, is talking about possibly starting his own business. Olivia has transitioned into a more creative role at her PR firm and is considering going back to school for a degree in business. To reward their hard work, I decided to increase their inheritance. This isn't just about giving them more money. It's a recognition of how far they've come and how proud I am of their progress. Just when I thought things had settled down and that my family was finally on the right track, life threw a series of unexpected and, frankly, shocking events at us. It feels strange writing this after what I thought was the final update to our journey, but sometimes the calm after the storm hides an even bigger tempest. What has transpired over the last six months is almost unbelievable. Everything seemed to be going well. Mason had been promoted yet again this time to a managerial position at the shipping company, and Olivia was thriving in her creative role at the public relations firm. They both had a sense of stability, a rhythm to their lives that I hadn't seen in years. My wife and I were quietly patting ourselves on the back for sticking to our plan. And then, everything changed. I got a call at 3 a.m. one night, never a good sign. It was from Mason, his voice shaky and panicked. He was calling from a hospital in the neighboring city. The words hit me like a punch to the gut. Dad, I've been arrested. I was half awake, barely able to make sense of what he was saying. Apparently, Mason had gone out for drinks with some co-workers to celebrate his latest promotion. What started as a harmless night out turned into an absolute nightmare. They were at a bar, celebrating like usual, when a brawl broke out between a group of patrons. Mason wasn't involved at first. He wasn't even near the fight. But in the chaos, someone threw a punch in his direction. Mason, trying to defend himself, swung back, and it all escalated from there. What he didn't realize at the time was that the person he hit wasn't just any bar patron. It was the son of a well-known local businessman, someone with significant influence in the area. Mason's one punch was enough to send the young man to the hospital with a fractured jaw. As soon as I heard this, I knew things were about to spiral. The businessman's family wasted no time pressing charges, and Mason was facing serious consequences. My wife and I rushed to the hospital to find Mason bruised and shaken. The reality of what had happened was starting to hit him, and I could see the regret written all over his face. It wasn't just about the physical fight, it was about everything. He had worked so hard to get his life back on track, to prove that he could stand on his own, and now he was facing criminal charges that could ruin everything. We hired a lawyer immediately, but the businessman's family wasn't interested in a peaceful resolution. They wanted to make an example out of Mason, dragging his name through the mud in the process. The news got out, and soon enough, local media was covering the story of a promising young manager who had gotten into a violent altercation. Mason's boss, who had once praised him for his dedication, called the next day to inform him that he was suspended until further notice. It was a disaster. In one night, Mason went from having everything going for him to standing on the brink of losing it all. My wife and I tried to be supportive, but the tension in the house was unbearable. Mason was filled with guilt, anger, and shame. He rarely left his room, and when he did, it was only to meet with his lawyer. The court date was looming, and the weight of it all was crushing him. I'd never seen him so broken. As if Mason's situation wasn't enough, 
Olivia had her own bombshell to drop. In the middle of all the chaos surrounding Mason's arrest, I noticed Olivia had been acting strangely. She was spending more time on her phone, taking mysterious calls late at night, and was often out of the house for work-related events. At first, I didn't think much of it. Her career in public relations was demanding, and networking events were part of the job. But something felt off. One evening, my wife and I were having dinner alone at home when Olivia came back earlier than usual. She seemed distracted, anxious even. After a few moments of awkward silence, she finally blurted it out. Dad, Mom, I'm moving to Los Angeles next month. Los Angeles? The words barely registered. What was she talking about? She had a stable job here. She was doing well. But the more she explained, the worse it got. Olivia had secretly been planning to quit her job and leave for LA to pursue her original dream of becoming an influencer full-time. She had been offered an opportunity by a major social media brand to promote their products, and they promised her significant income if she moved to the West Coast. This wasn't just a career move. It felt like a betrayal. My wife was devastated. Olivia had worked so hard to build her career, and now she was throwing it all away for a quick shot at fame. We had been down this road before, and we both knew how risky it was. But Olivia was adamant. She had made up her mind. The worst part? She had been negotiating this deal behind our backs for months. I couldn't believe it. After all the progress, after all the lessons we tried to teach, Olivia was going right back to chasing fame and fortune without any real substance. She didn't care about stability or the foundation she had built. She just wanted the fast track to success. I tried to talk her out of it, but Olivia wouldn't listen. She accused me of holding her back, of not understanding the potential she had in the social media world. In her eyes, this was her big break, and nothing I said could change her mind. When she left for L.A., it felt like a part of our family was ripped away. My wife cried for days, heartbroken that Olivia had chosen to walk away from everything we had built together. And to make matters worse, Olivia's relationship with Mason, once strong, deteriorated overnight. She saw his situation as a cautionary tale, a warning about the dangers of settling for a safe life. The rift between them grew wider by the day. As if things couldn't get any worse, another shock was waiting for us, one that had been buried for years. One afternoon, I received an unexpected letter in the mail. It was from a law firm in the city, notifying me of an inheritance I wasn't aware of. Confused, I called the number on the letter, and after some initial back and forth, the lawyer explained the situation. Apparently, there had been some overlooked assets from my parents' estate, a small piece of land and a business investment they had made decades ago. It wasn't much, but the timing of this discovery was curious. But that wasn't the shocking part. In the process of sorting out these newly uncovered assets, the lawyer stumbled upon a hidden document, a letter from my father addressed to me, but never sent. The lawyer sent me a copy of the letter, and as I read it, my hands began to tremble. My father, a man I had always believed to be hardworking and honest, had been keeping a huge secret from me my entire life. The letter revealed that my father had, in fact, made most of his early fortune through questionable means, an illegal business deal that had provided the foundation for his wealth. The real estate investments he had passed down to me, they were the product of dirty money. My father, a man I had idolized and spent my entire life trying to live up to, had built his fortune on deception. I was stunned. The foundation of my entire life, my business, everything I had worked for, was tainted by this revelation. I didn't know how to process it. How could I have spent my life preaching hard work and honesty to my children when the legacy I was passing down to them was built on lies? I couldn't bring myself to tell Mason or Olivia. They were already dealing with enough. But I confided in my wife, and together, we wrestled with the weight of this truth. It changed everything. The way I saw my father, the way I saw myself, and the way I saw the future of our family. Mason's court case dragged on for months. The media coverage died down, but the legal proceedings were brutal. In the end, Mason was convicted of misdemeanor assault and given probation. His reputation took a hit, but the real damage was internal. He struggled with the shame of what had happened, and despite returning to work, he was never quite the same. He became more withdrawn, more guarded, and his confidence was shattered. Olivia, 
meanwhile, was thriving in L.A., at least on the surface. Her social media following exploded, and she seemed to be living the dream. But as the months went on, cracks began to show. The pressure of constantly staying relevant was wearing her down. She called home less and less, and when she did, it was usually to ask for advice or help, though she never admitted it outright. The secret about my father's past continued to haunt me. I started questioning everything. The decisions I had made, the lessons I had tried to teach my children, was it all built on a lie? I couldn't shake the feeling that I had failed them in more ways than one. Six months after Mason's trial and Olivia's move to L.A., tragedy struck. My wife and I were visiting a friend in a neighboring town when we got the call. It was from Olivia's agent in L.A. She had been involved in a car accident, one that left her in critical condition. We rushed to the airport and flew out to be by her side. We rushed to the airport and flew out to be by Olivia's side. But the situation was worse than we could have imagined. Olivia had been driving late at night, coming home from an influencer event, when she lost control of her car on a winding road. She wasn't wearing a seatbelt, and the impact left her with severe injuries, multiple fractures, internal bleeding, and head trauma. The doctors weren't optimistic. They told us that Olivia had slipped into a coma, and there was no guarantee she would ever wake up. My wife was inconsolable, and I felt like my world was falling apart. In that moment, I realized that all the arguments, all the frustrations, none of it mattered anymore. All I wanted was for my daughter to survive. We stayed by Olivia's side for weeks, hoping and praying that she would recover, but there was little change. My wife barely left her bedside, while I tried to manage everything back home. Mason's situation, the family business, and this newfound secret about my father that continued to weigh on me like a dark cloud. I hadn't told anyone yet, not even Mason, but I knew that eventually, I would have to. As if things couldn't get any worse, Mason began to unravel under the pressure of everything that had happened. He blamed himself for Olivia's accident, convinced that their strained relationship had contributed to her driving recklessly that night. His guilt consumed him, and he began drinking heavily. He showed up at the hospital drunk on more than one occasion, and it became clear that Mason was spiraling out of control. One night, after a particularly heavy bout of drinking, Mason got into a car and drove to the hospital, determined to see his sister. He didn't make it far before he was pulled over by the police for swerving on the road. It was a DUI, and this time, there was no talking his way out of it. Mason was arrested on the spot, and we received a call from the station in the middle of the night. I couldn't believe it. My son, who had worked so hard to turn his life around, was falling apart right in front of me. I felt powerless. I was stuck in LA with my wife, watching our daughter fight for her life, while my son back home was destroying his. The guilt was unbearable. I flew back to handle Mason's situation, leaving my wife alone in LA. It was the hardest thing I'd ever done, but I didn't have a choice. Mason needed help, and I wasn't going to lose both of my children. When I saw him at the police station, he was a shell of the person I had known. He was broken, filled with regret, and completely lost. I bailed him out, but the consequences of his actions were starting to catch up with him. His DUI charge could lead to jail time, and this time, there would be no leniency. In the weeks that followed, I finally broke down and told Mason everything about my father. The hidden wealth, the illegal business deals, the legacy that had haunted me since I'd found out. I told him because I thought he deserved to know the truth, and because I hoped that by understanding the complexity of our family's past, he might find a way to forgive himself for his own mistakes. Mason was shocked. He had always idolized his grandfather, just like I had, and learning that our family's wealth was tainted by criminal activity shook him to his core. For a while, it seemed like this revelation only made things worse. Mason distanced himself from me even more, as if learning the truth had destroyed the image he had of the man he wanted to become. But slowly, as time passed, I began to see a change in him. Mason started going to therapy, both for his drinking problem and to deal with the guilt he carried from Olivia's accident. He stopped blaming himself for her condition, and for the first time in a long time, he started to rebuild. It wasn't easy. He had to face the possibility of jail time for the DUI but he was finally taking responsibility for his actions. Months passed, and just when we thought there was no hope, Olivia woke up. It was a miracle, 
something none of the doctors had expected. She was weak, disoriented, and had a long road to recovery ahead of her, but she was alive. My wife and I were overwhelmed with relief, but we knew this was just the beginning of a new battle. Olivia's memory was patchy, and she struggled to piece together the events that had led to her accident. The doctors told us that she might never fully remember what happened that night, and in some ways, that was a blessing. She didn't have to carry the weight of her reckless choices as heavily as we feared, but her recovery was going to be slow, and she would need months of physical therapy just to regain her strength. When Mason came to visit her in the hospital for the first time, I saw something I hadn't seen in years, genuine vulnerability. He broke down in tears the moment he saw her, apologizing over and over for everything that had happened, for the fights, for the way they had drifted apart. Olivia, in her fragile state, just smiled weakly and told him it was okay. It was a small moment, but it was a step toward healing the rift between them. As we move forward, things are far from perfect, but we're learning how to navigate this new reality. Mason is still facing the consequences of his DUI, but he's working hard to turn his life around. He's sober now, going to therapy regularly, and trying to rebuild his relationship with Olivia and the rest of the family. His future is uncertain, but for the first time in a long time, he seems hopeful. Olivia, too, is making progress. She's determined to regain her independence, though her influencer career is no longer the priority it once was. The accident changed her perspective, and she's now focused on her health and well-being. She's talked about going back to school to finish her degree, something we never thought we'd hear her say again. As for me, I'm still grappling with the truth about my father's past. It's something I'll carry with me for the rest of my life, but I'm learning to accept it. I've come to realize that my family's legacy isn't defined by the mistakes of the past, but by the choices we make moving forward. I don't know what the future holds for Mason, Olivia, or any of us, but we're doing our best to rebuild, one day at a time. Life has thrown us more curveballs than I ever could have imagined, but we're still standing, and for that, I'm grateful.